Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. My name is uh, Jacob Daniels uh, here at Brayburn Whiskey. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is our mid-year whiskey cask market overview, um, which is essentially an analysis of data that we've gathered over the past six months. For those of you that perhaps haven't seen our previous um, whiskey cask market overviews, these are done every six months, twice a year. Um, and we use a data modeling algorithm, um, which provides us with metrics that gives us valuable insights into uh, the performance of the whiskey cast market. Um, I have to forgive me as I go through these slides. So just to give you uh, a sort of a brief sort of description of what the, uh, the whiskey cast market view is about. It's a biannual market report conducted by Brayburn Whiskey and Cask 88, our uh, sort of sister company. Uh, and it's the biggest report of its kind in the market. This is the fourth report that we have uh, we published since 2019. And as I said, the report uses unique data modeling, um, a data modeling algorithm developed to analyze the whiskey cast market. And data is based on the BC20 index which is a collection of casks from leading distilleries. Um, since it began in the market, the report has analysed thousands of casks from hundreds of different distilleries. Um, in the first half of 2021, trends were identified in the last whisky cask market overview. These trends have strengthened, including the diversification in the profiles of whisky cask investors. And it also demonstrates the remarkable stability of cast performance across the board. Um, first, the key points that we, uh, we've gleaned from it, the uh, average annual capital growth rate, this is the average projected growth across all casks that we looked at in our data, is 12.84%, which is pretty much identical to uh, the reports um, at the start of 2021, which gave us an average growth of 1276 um, we saw a little bit of a slow in the second half of 2020. The BC index continues to show uh, a stable incline, though, having grown by 14.33% in the last 12 months. Um, when we look at the top 10 whiskey distilleries, they've all witnessed increasing growth in 2021 with projected returns ranging from 13.42% to an impressive 18.87%. And the average protected annual growth for the distilleries in the top 10 was 15.45%. Um, Isley remains the best performing region with the top three distilleries in the table coming from this island powerhouse. Stoysia, the, uh, the peated spirit from Bunna Harbin, has moved up one place to take the top position in our rankings. And uh, Isley Cousins, Lefroig and Bonaharben, we say cousins, obviously Bonaharben are responsible for the production of Stoysia, but they have also performed strongly and they're in second and third places respectively. Um, and what we've seen is continued stability among all the assets classes included in the report, while gold has dropped, the stock market's recovered, um, the value of the BC20 index remains largely unchanged. Um, what we did see with younger casks uh, was an increase in annualized projected growth, rising from 34.34% after reaching 31.13% in our 2020 end of year report. And that, that's essentially the first three years of the cask maturation period, because it's quite an important sort of event occurs in year three, um, according to the sort of Scottish Whiskey Association. Each whiskey needs to have matured in a cask for a minimum of three years. So um, that's obviously a big milestone for the cask. And that's why we see such a significant jump in value over the course of those uh, first three years. Um, what we also saw is that investors generally, 81.6% um, of investors expect the whiskey market, the whiskey cast market to grow in 2021 compared to 68.2% who anticipate growth in the stock market. 
So despite uncertainty in global markets, the steady growth across most distilleries, regions and age categories in the first half of 2021 continues to demonstrate the stability of the whiskey cast market. Um, the BC20 index continues to rise. Um, this index is made from a subset of all of our cast data. We collate the projected values of the representative sample of 20 casks from assorted distilleries, which gives us a sort of um, a broad snapshot of um, Scottish whiskey production, including, as I said, uh, a broad range of distilleries, cast types and regions. And the BC20 index has exhibited remarkably steady growth in the first half of 2021. And this is largely in line with the general trajectory of the index over the last couple of years, excluding the slight dip that we witnessed in 2020, the uh, second half of 2020, which could be explained by the strengthening of investor confidence in traditional assets, uh, temporarily reducing the demand for tangible assets such as cask whiskey. Yet the BC20 index seems to have recovered from the turbulence of last year, and it is projected to show continued stable growth. Um, we feel that the reasons for this may be due to a more um, a diversified approach to portfolios post-COVID and also the entry into the market um, of a wider range of investor profiles. And, uh, and I think the expression, the year of hard assets is how people are describing 2021. And our index suggests that this is very much the case. And as I said, the significant rise in new make casts that, uh, that we've seen there are reflected elsewhere in the report can be taken as a strong indication of increasing activity amongst new investors in the market who are prepared to take a long-term view and, uh, and show some patience in their, uh, their whiskey cask investing approach. So stability in rough waters. If we look at this graph here, this shows a projected value of a portfolio over time, assuming an initial investment of £100,000 was made in July 2018. Over this period, you can see that the BC20 index has shown the most stable and consistent growth among all the asset classes. Um, in comparison, during the first half of 2021, gold dipped slightly. This is no doubt as a result of the investors moving their money back into the, uh, to the financial markets. Um, and as the economy has obviously entered a more stable period. However, cask whiskey booked the trend away from tangible assets and continued to rise above the average, outperforming all other assets except Bitcoin which obviously a much more volatile sort of uh, option. Um, and that continued in a more volatile trajectory throughout the beginning of the year. According to the figures in our report, um, a hundred thousand pound investment made in July, 2018, in June, 2021, would have been worth 182,000 pounds, 940. Um, in mid 2021 for cast whiskey, or £149,660 for gold. Um, an investment in the best performing stock index, the S&P 500, would have been worth £148,110. Um, overall, average annual capital growth is at 12.84%. Um, the whiskey cask investment market has shown itself to be remarkably robust in the face of economic uncertainty caused by the, uh, the pandemic we've all had to endure. Uh, and this is probably due to the nature of whiskey itself, an asset that has historically observed steady increases in value as it sits in the cask, relatively protected from the movements in the global economy outside. Um, over three periods of observation, six months periods, a total of 18 months, the average annual capital growth rate over our entire cast set fluctuated by less than a percentage point, which is obviously a clear demonstration of the relative stability of the whiskey cast market. It remains to be seen whether the index will continue to grow at this uh, stable rate or whether growth rates will continue to climb as it did pre-pandemic, but it appears that the growth rate is on an upward trajectory and given the rising inflationary environment, which may prompt investors towards hard assets, we expect the projected annual capital growth to regain or even exceed its high 
of the first half of 2020 by the end of this year. Um, this is the distillery league table. So this is basically our top 10 performing casks. Um, the overall projected capital growth chart shows that a whiskey cask can be expected to generate an average, on average, a 12.84% increase in value per annum, a figure that is the average across all distilleries and distilleries and regions in Scotland. And so for a more nuanced analysis of the top performers, we've broken that down or broken that down by individual distillery. So the top 10 distilleries have maintained a solid performance over the last six months with an average projected capital growth of 15.59%. And once again, the top three places are taken by Spirit Distilled in Isla. Um, the only change there being in the positions in the respect to the last report, Stoysia, again, this is the petered expression from Bonner Harbin, and Lefroy, another uh, Isla Powerhouse, have swapped places and, and Bunner Harbour remains in third place. Um, and the only distillery to sort of really break the monopoly on that top five has been Highland Park, um, an island whiskey that keeps its fourth position ahead of uh, another island malt, Kalia, which remains in fifth place. So overall, these uh, there's been a little change in the distillery rankings, which demonstrates the good internal stability of the whiskey cast market. However, Two new distilleries have entered the list with strong performances in the first half of 2021, Glen Allakey and Mortlach, Mortlach being a favourite of mine, the wee witchy. Um, they're newcomers to watch out for over the next few months. And it's interesting to note that both young and long established distilleries have places on the table. So the... Uh, the region's lead table, again, Isla is, uh, is always a big feature, um, reflecting the rise in the average annual projected capital growth. Every region aside from the lowlands saw an increase compared to the report last year. The strong performance of Isla distilleries is a story that continues, obviously. The Hebridean Island once again outperforming the rest to take the top place as the, uh, the region with the strongest growth. And uh, the popularity of casks in the region shows no sign of abating, thanks probably to demand for high quality casks, um, outpacing supply in the market, and obviously the global reputation of Isla for the production of exceptional peated single malt. Um, however, it's nice to see Campbelltown's strong performance in the first half of 2021. And that's, uh, we think, testament to the fact that cask investors often look beyond the more renowned whiskey making regions for opportunities, despite uh, often being under the radar compared to the more famous rivals. Campbelltown was a region that saw the highest growth compared to the last report. And obviously Campbelltown is quite unique in that it only has three distilleries in the region, three excellent distilleries, which are um, Springbank, Glen Scotia, and Glen, where are we? Glen Goyle. Um, the rest of the list is pretty much unchanged. Once again, highlighting the market stability mentioned elsewhere in our report, uh, the continued slowing of growth of the lowlands region is worth keeping an eye on in coming months to see if this uh, deceleration is structural or temporal. And then we've also, uh, we've got here the returns associated with the age of the cask that you're investing in. So this table shows the average projected annual capital growth figure for each range of casks as of the date shown there in the table. Um, and taking an average of the projected increase in value for all casks from the designated age range across all distilleries and regions. So younger casks will offer a greater percentage return for those with the patience to wait um, as well as a more affordable initial investment. On average, one can expect a recently filled cask to increase in value by 33% per year for the first three years of its lifetime. As I said, this is uh, uh, due to the fact that your ethanol and water in a wooden cask uh, at three years old becomes whiskey. Um, cask choices at an older age will require a greater initial buy-in, obviously. Um, as they are already sort of in their prime, but every year 
are uh, projected to yield a significant return in pure monetary terms. And demand for older cash is kept high by their rarity, obviously, a feature that intensifies with every passing year as more of these casks are getting bottled. Uh, and subsequently drunk, we hope. And we saw a huge increase in demand for casks of younger ages in 2020, and this trend is continuing. The, uh, the market for private cask ownership is obviously maturing. Um, and the more people are learning about the benefits and entering this market for themselves, casks of a younger age are an easier entry point for investors. So the growth of this portion of the market may indicate that more new investors they're again discovering private cask ownership. Um, a lower cost investment such as these could also play a part in a, a more diversified portfolio. So a little observation there over the three periods of observation, a total of 18 months, the average capital growth rate fluctuated by less than a percentage point, a clear demonstration of the uh, relative stability of the uh, of the whiskey cask market. So what to look out for in 2022? Um, will inflation change the investment landscape and profoundly impact the global economy? Will the cask market continue to provide stability? How will the arrival of new technology impact the market? Um, with the easing of the pandemic, how will the BC index, the BC20 index, perform against other asset classes? And which casks and distilleries can we expect to perform well in 22? On which ones will start to drop out of the uh, out of the top 10? Um, there's a bit more here that I'd like to go through. Um, one of the uh, one of the sort of my observations has been that. We've seen the stereotype, the typical whiskey drinker is, I'm just going to get rid of this slide, actually, and see if we can get this full screen. Okay, there we go. So one of the, uh, the other observations that we've made is that the stereotype, the typical whiskey drinker, um, is very much or has been very much represented in the demographic of buyers up until recently. In 2020, men made up an overwhelming 91.2% of buyers and 68.1% were older than 40. However, there are signs now that the market is opening up to a new and diversified range of cask owners. Women are being represented in greater numbers. 7.5% of total buyers in 2021 identified as female, which was up from 4.4% in 2019. Um, and joint ownership is becoming more popular as well, um, with 5.1% of cash bought in 2021, having more than one owner listed on their certificates. And this is up from 1% in 2020, in sort of 2019. Um, the other, just to give you some insight into um, the various indexes that I'm making reference to here, just to clarify that, the BC20 index, this is an index made up, as I said, from a subset of all of our cast data. And what we've attempted to do is pick out a number of distilleries, um, a number of regions, a number of cast types and ages to give sort of a fair and broad snapshot of the entire Scottish whisky cask industry. Um, and as I said, if we look at that, we've seen a remarkable steady growth first half of 21-21 in line with the, uh, the general trajectory of the, in of the index. Um, that's really the sort of the summary of the uh, of the report, um, as we said, the, the sort of we hope that this data will give investors um, a, a a sort of a clear insight into how whiskey casks will appreciate in value. And one of the key things to remember is obviously that all of these casks one day will have to be bottled. Um, we can only sort of have our um, our whiskey. of our whiskey maturing for a certain period of time um, before the ABV on that alcohol drops to a critical level. Obviously, we, we need to bottle that whiskey before it hits 40%. Uh, and one thing that we have seen is a, a clear correlation between how 
bottled whiskey will increase in value incrementally with the age, and we're seeing exactly that correlating with uh, with whiskey casks. Um, so in summary, what we have with whiskey, the whiskey cask market is stability. Um, we've seen steady growth year on year. Um, the data demonstrates to us that uh, whiskey functions as a clear hedge against volatility in other markets. Um, and as I, I constantly say, while there's no promises to sort of make overnight fortunes investing in whiskey, what you will see is steady capital growth um, with an asset that's unlike any other in that your asset physically changes every year. And it's that physical change that will drive the value of your asset forward. Um, I'm quite happy to take some questions. I can see already that it's a couple of people are um, asking me some questions. I've got a, a question here. What is the logic behind value growth in that north to three years being so much higher? Surely that will attract more investment and so even out returns over the whole life. Um, I'll try and answer that for you, David. Obviously, when we talk about um, those first initial years, um, the capital outlay associated with the young cast is obviously relatively low, but you will see that dramatic increase in value over the, uh, the first three years. And then subsequently, that will level out and be a reflection of the, uh, of the average uh, that we see on the, uh, on the index. Um, so there's always an argument that perhaps investing in new filled casts is the way to go. Um, which is it's a reasonable assumption, but as we always say to investors, you know your capital outlay is always going to re reflect in the capital return. And if you if you want to invest a significant amount in a large uh, batch of new filled casks, there obviously are some additional costs associated with the management of those casks. Um, and I think as well, you know, if you're looking at a shorter term investment, then the older casks are uh, the more viable option to put into back into the market um, in a shorter with a shorter investment horizon. If that answers your question, David, another question from David. Um, why do you think returns on whiskey over 25 years old are so low when they have much greater rarity value? But again, um, it relative to um, when we look at bottling, you'd see there that the, these rare whiskey expressions do command significant sums. But um, in terms of that rate of appreciation, it does tend to slow a little bit uh, as the years pass. But certainly if you look at the averages, 12.84% being the average, you know, double digit returns are easily achievable. Um, um, Julian, when you mentioned Highland Park earlier, is that their Whitlaw cask? That's a good question. They are marketed um, as a cask, as Whitlaw. This is a requirement from Edmonton Group that um, these, but that doesn't have any impact on uh, the bottling. Obviously, when we're investing in casks from the Highland Park Distillery, we're very much investing in the brand. And uh, whilst the marketing of casks, we're required by Edmonton Group to call them Whitlaw casks. When they are finally bottled, uh, as is the case with uh, with any distillery that we deal with, they can be bottled as distilled at Highland Park. Um, Max is asking, what margin does your company make on average per cast sale? Um, I don't actually have the answer to that. Um, it really depends. We we have a massive amount of inventory in uh, at our Craig Ellicky warehouse. Some of these casts are casts that have been on our personal, our company portfolio for a number of years. Uh, so clearly we will have benefited there from the appreciation in value of those particular casks. Um, it, there isn't an exact figure. Obviously the key thing is to make sure that when people are investing in these casts, they're investing in at what is current market price. Um, Adam is asking, do you expect new fill casts to outperform age barrels going forward? Um, certainly for the first three years, the data shows us that um, you're going to get, you know, in excess of 33% per annum return on a new fill cask. Um, but that obviously levels out at year four. And then you would expect, depending on the distillery type or, or the distillery, depending on the region, depending on the cask type, it to then appreciate in line with, uh, with the data that we're seeing here. Yeah. 
survey the market is necessarily based on what this is ian hi ian nice to hear from you um the survey of the market is necessarily based on one player's assets can you talk about how to sell the whiskey um i'm not entirely sure i understand that question Ian. i i, I will perhaps uh, come back to you on that perhaps i could uh, drop an email across or we could uh, have a conversation and i can get into a bit more detail about what you're driving at there um can you talk about how to sell the whiskey in x years time well you you've got a number of options there um obviously we talk about this quite often exit obviously a very very important aspect of the investment but uh, typically an investor will buy a cask and um put that back into the market typically before it's, it's it needs to be bottled and in that event we would simply match that cask with another investor um somebody who has a slightly perhaps different investment objectives than your own they're obviously going to pay you the premium associated with the age of that cask that premium essentially being your profit until we arrive at a point where the cask needs to be bottled and at, and and then at that point it'll either be bottled by ourselves one of our sister companies or one of our bottling independent bottling partners can you speak to production increases at the distilleries um we are the demand year on year is increasing i think um obviously last year was a bit of a tough year um the whiskey industry didn't escape that and as a result production was down and uh, we've seen a 32 percent increase i believe in production this year but a lot of that is basically getting back to where we were pre-pandemic um it's Production of whiskey in Scotland is primarily about um, blended whiskies, and so single malt is a very, very small sort of almost niche area of Scottish whiskey production. Um, you'll see that a lot of distilleries that had previously uh, only provided whiskies for blenders are now uh, bottling their own single malts. Uh, and this is in an effort to keep up with demand. Uh, and I, I say this quite often when I'm speaking to people for the first time, that we have a, a genuine gap in supply and demand when it comes to single malt whiskies. This focus, uh, there's always been the focus in Scotland of producing whiskies for blends. Um, now, new sort of consumers coming to the market very much enjoy single malt whiskies. And uh, any increase in production is good news for us because as it stands, we're simply not producing enough whiskey to, uh, to satisfy demand. Certainly when we talk about single malts, and this is why you see a lot of new distilleries that are coming to the market enjoying such success. Um, Max is asking me, what are the management costs of managing large amounts of cash, for example, five years um, in terms of storage, insurance, et cetera? Um, the, your only associated cost is storage and insurance. Um, we do at our Craig Elegy warehouse, which sort of makes us a little bit sort of unique, stands us out from the competition, is that in addition to just storing your cash, we do offer a number of, of other warehouse services. Management of the wood is, is a very, very important element to the service that we offer. Um, so over the course of the lifetime that you might own a cask, Max, you, we would advise you, uh, depending on how long you want to keep that cask on your portfolio, we would perhaps advise you at some point to consider re-racking that, uh, that cask, which is essentially um, um, decanting your whiskey from its existing cask, whether that be a, a virgin oak or a, an ex-bourbon cask, and decanting that whiskey into perhaps um, a sherry cask, for example. Uh, this is a process we call re-racking uh, and that just goes towards producing a unique whiskey when it's eventually bottled but it also can have a fairly significant impact on the value of your cask I mean, when we look at the data it tells us that um, sherry cask for example will command between 20 at 20 and 25 percent premium on the value of uh, the equivalent whiskey in a bourbon cask um so Ash is asking me about the tax advantages. Um, as it stands, whiskey, and, I, and we don't see any reason for this to, to change, but as it stands, HMRC regard whiskey as what we call a wasting asset and chattel. Um, as I'd said earlier, the um, 
whiskey can only it effectively has a shelf life you know you can't mature whiskey forever it has to be bottled before the alcohol drops below this all important 40 percent mark which is um, scottish whiskey association's requirement that all whiskies have to have an alcohol or abv above 40 percent so it's essentially a, a wasting asset it has a shelf life and as a result of that um on the sale of a cast that remains in bond then you don't attract any capital gains tax on the return that you see on your investment um so Marion's asking do you see a big uprise in rebarreling uh, or, or re-racking casks um, absolutely that this is something that we uh we intend to sort of work more closely with with our clients and um for two reasons, it's obviously to maximize the return that you see from the investment and just to enable our, our, our clients, our investors to create sort of special and unique whiskies. And, and, and it's, it's a really nice thing to do. You know, you're investing in heritage distilleries, you know, these storage distilleries with great history behind them. And for those of you that are, uh, are whiskey fans, you'll know that uh, quite often your your favorite whiskies will have uh, will have been in multiple different casks um, and and we think that this is something that uh, is a great service to offer to our clients so we can work together maximize your returns and in addition create very very special whiskies um, How can a two-year period of your BC20 index really give support for long-term investment without more information about the supply and demand for whiskey? Um, I'm not entirely sure what your the question, and forgive me, Aaron, if I don't understand the question correctly, but um, um, a two-year period of your BC20 index really gives support for long-term investment. Um, whilst we've been publishing this report for two years, the data that we used spans back many years we we've gathered lots of data points historically for the value of casts in different regions um, different distilleries different cast types and it's these data points that give us we feel uh, a relatively accurate view of certainly the perform current performance of the whiskey cask investment market and um, what we can expect from it in the future How does the last two years of economic stability compare with the 2007-2008 financial crisis regarding whiskey casts? This is a question from Michael. Um, what it, it, this is this is a really good question, and it sort of comes back to uh, the point that I made earlier, and something that's been highlighted in this report, and the data suggests this really is a genuine hedge against these sort of uh, these sort of financial events um whiskey is probably one of the only assets that you can invest in michael that actually physically changes every year and it's that physical change as opposed to external forces that uh, that drive the value of your uh, your whiskey asset forward uh, if that if that sort of helps at all um peter peter von what do you see as a market price for a cask what's your reference um, again, if I'm understanding correctly, Peter, what you see as the market price for a cask? Well, obviously, the, you know, no cask is the same. Every cask is unique. Um, I, I, again, I, I'm not entirely sure what's your reference. Well, I, I come back to the data points, the, the historical data points that we use. Um, and this, I think the data goes, spans back about seven years now. Um, so Max is asking, I just wanted to ensure that cash supplies to investors like myself are at fair value. How do we as investors cross-examine this? It's a good question. Um, more often than not, when uh, we're looking at a cast together, we'll look at the projected returns. Obviously, it's key that there's a correlation between bottle prices and uh, and the value of that cask and that's that would be a sort of key indicator um, and in addition to that um you know we are not the only company in the market so if you you know if you're looking around you'll see that um 
if we're not sort of if our casts aren't in line with market price then or we're essentially not going to be able to you know investors will go elsewhere so it's pretty critical that as i said there's a correlation first of all between cast prices and bottle prices and obviously um we're not the only sort of company in the market so we all have to sort of operate within market parameters uh, Sam's asking me, do you see sherry cast continue to perform well in the coming few years or any other cast type you see increasing in value? Um, we, sherry cast, are, the, you know, the, the, it's been an element of whiskey production and cast management, wood management for, for decades, centuries. So um, we don't see any reason at all why the popularity of sherry cast won't continue at that trajectory. Um, there are other sort of uh, finishes now being introduced to the market. We're increasingly seeing rum finishes, um, wine finishes. And I think if you look at sort of bottles out there in the market, they will invariably command a premium over and above um, the traditional American bourbon casks. Uh, Callan's asking, a new fill cast hard to come by as the returns are relatively high for the first three, three years. Are they pre-sold before being filled or sold to preferred clients? Um, they are relatively hard to come by at the moment. Uh, again, referring back to what was a difficult year for the, uh, for the industry last year. Obviously, distilleries uh, at various points were closed for production. Some distilleries um, switched production to, uh, to sanitary products. So as a result of that, this year in particular, um, they are a little thinner on the ground. Uh, we, they, given the the low sort of entry point for the uh, for new fill casts, when we do get them, they tend to sort of be sold very very quickly, uh, and we do from time to time pre-sell casts that are that are due to be filled. Um, we gen generally don't ex market them externally. Um, just because they're, 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 again they're, they're such a low price point they sort of forgive this sort of turn of phrase a bit of a no-brainer so uh, we don't market them externally and they tend to be offered initially to clients um somebody's asking here where are the various distillery casts stored assuming they must remain in a bonded warehouse that's absolutely correct all maturing whiskey in scotland has to remain inside a bonded warehouse until such time as the uh, the spirit is released for bottling at that point, the uh, the appropriate duties on the alcohol and, and VAT will be paid. Um, we are fortunate enough here at Brayburn Whiskey to own and operate our own bonded warehouse facilities um, in Craig Ellicky outside of Abelour in Speyside. Um, and again, this is a, a real advantage both for investors and bottlers because we're able to offer you a number of warehouse services, again, referring back to um, the possibility of you enhancing or maximizing the return you see from your investment by um, re-racking this sort of thing. And if investors at any point ever want to bottle their casts, again, this is something that we can work with you on. Sam's asking, how do you see new tech platforms such as online cask auctions, cash share, et cetera, impacting the market? Um, again, it's, it, when we talk about whiskey assets, we're ultimately talking about something that will be consumed, bottled and consumed. Um, so it, we welcome, obviously, uh, the, these tech platforms that were giving uh, investors access to a market that was previously uh, only open to whiskey insiders. Um, how will it impact the market? I think from our perspective, it's the availability of casks. That, that, that's the real sort of issue that, that we have as a company, that investors have, and that is um, identity, buying the casks, getting, getting hold of these casks. Um, and obviously, if there's more people in the market, people are able to buy them online, et cetera, et cetera. It'll only result in sort of the cash becoming increasingly scarcer. Um, Greg, yes, this uh, this recording, for, for those of you perhaps want to refer back to it, it will be uh, posted up on our website uh, at some point next week. What is Brayburn's perspective of the seller's market right now, positive or negative? Again, there, there's, you know, there's a, an extremely high demand for whiskey. Uh, and I, I, you know, come back again to this point that uh, there is a genuine shortage 
of single malt Scotch whiskey in the market. Um, we, we, if you're in a position, if you have a cast that you wish to sell, put back into the market, then as I quite often say to my clients, that they'll, they'll be sold relatively quickly and, and demand is very, very high. Mm -hmm. Um, is it right that peated whiskies tend to be good to go between four to eight years? This is Martin. Um, Martin, um, good to go. I'm not sure what you mean by that. I, I'm, assu I'm assuming you perhaps say, are they good to be bottled between four and eight years? Um, with the peated whiskies, what tends to happen is if they spend uh, extended periods of time in the cast, you start to lose that peated character. Um, so... Again, I mean, would it be good to bottle a peated whiskey between four to eight years old? I would say absolutely, yes. I recently tasted something from the Kalia distillery, which is, I think, seven years old, and it was an exceptional whiskey. Um, a good question here from Ethan. What are the risks investors in CAS face, and how do we mitigate the risks? Um, the obvious risk is, is the popularity and the increased um, consumption of whiskey. Um, relative to other spirits in the market. Whiskey doesn't sort of suffer from being uh, fashionable or a fad. We, uh, you know, with whiskey, there's an, a, a phenomenal amount of work and time goes into the production and maturation of a good quality whiskey, which isn't the case with, um, with other spirits. And, and obviously, the, you know, the heritage associated with the distilleries that produce these whiskies. Um, so we don't see anything to suggest that uh, whiskey consumption will drop. In fact, looking at recent data, the, the suggestion is that the global whiskey market will have actually doubled in size, uh, in size by 2030. So um, that's certainly a risk, but not one that we feel is, a, is an, an immediate concern. And how do we mitigate the risk? Um, I, I come back again to the re-racking and warehouse service. How do we mitigate risk? I was having a conversation earlier on with a, with a client about sort of leaving a whiskey for a, an excessive amount of time in a virgin oak cask, for example. That may well, over the course of decades, result in quite a woody whiskey. So again, we're working closely with our clients to ensure that the wood management of the whiskey is, is done correctly. So when these whiskies are finally bottled, they're of the highest possible quality. Um, David McKenzie is asking, if I purchase a cast today, decide to sell in bond in five years time, who or what dictates the selling price? Um, as a client of Brayburn Whiskey, David, you have access to, or you're given access to the online portal, you have your own account. And um, the, every cast that you have on your portfolio is appraised by us on an annual basis. And uh, so you've got a clear idea of what the current market value for your cask is. When the time comes to sell, we do, as you would expect, charge a commission for the sale of that cask. This is how we sort of keep the lights on. Um, but you, you have a, a, a very accurate idea of what your cask is worth at the time it comes to sell. Um, if you're re-racking the whiskey to a different finish, sure you are limiting the time left before you have to bottle it three years. That's not necessarily the case. Um, certainly when you look at sort of uh, multiple sort of cask whiskies, um, it may well spend, you know, a specific period of time in each cask, but that's not sort of carved in stone. So uh, the, the answer is no, you wouldn't be limiting the time left before you're having to bottle. A very good question here from another anonymous tenant. Given the certificates of title do not transfer ownership, how can cask investors be sure they can keep their casks? in case your company goes bankrupt? Well, let's, uh, let's hope and assume that's not gonna happen, but it's a very good question. Um, the certificates of title do not transfer ownership. Um, ownership of the cask is, is quite clear. There's a, a bill of sale associated with the investment. That's a legal document clearly demonstrating that you have bought this cask. And as a result of that, you are the owner of that cask. Um, certificates of title, uh, when you say they do not transfer ownership, uh, I'm not sure if I'm not really clear on what you're driving at there, but uh, there is ownership sits with the investor. 
Um, certificates of title demonstrate that ownership. Um, transfer of ownership occurs when um, when the purchase agreement is transacted. And the other thing that I should point out here, um, how can cask investors be sure that they can keep their cask in case your company goes bankrupt? Um, you have total autonomy over your cask. The key thing is that the warehouse where your casks are stored recognize you as the owner of that cask. Um, previously, the warehouse would only uh, recognize the person or the entity, actually, that's a uh, Wilder registered entity and has the account with the duty rep or warehouse. So despite the fact that you might own the cask, when you go to the warehouse, they'll have no record of you and therefore wouldn't be prepared until you've gone through some various legal sort of processes. Um, they wouldn't release that cast to you. That isn't the case with Brayburn Whiskey. As I said, we sort of operate our own warehouses in Craig Ellicke, in and that is managed by our duty rep. In the event that we were to sort of uh, have some sort of a liquidity event, then that, that again, that would have no impact on the ownership of your cast. You'd simply be paying the storage and insurance costs directly to the, uh, the duty rep that, uh, that owns, uh, operates the warehouse for us. Um, which distillery is he most excited about in the future? That's a good question, actually. And I've got, there are some distilleries that are making uh, sort of, uh, just find this for you. There, there are a few distilleries that we really like. Um, Mort, like I've mentioned, this is one that I think that you should really be keeping an eye on. Um, Ben Rinnis in Abalawa seems to uh, be increasing the annual projected capital growth rate is 12.36%. Um, Brookladic um, with an annual projected capital growth rate of 12.12%, another island distillery. Uh, Craig Ellicke, a favourite of ours because we're obviously uh, our warehouse facilities are in Craig Ellicke. Um, that's showing an annual projected growth of 8.7%. Um, yeah, it's often been in the shadow of its sort of uh, bigger space side cousins, but we expect um, exciting things from this exceptional distillery. And Ardmore, Ardmore has shown typically quite disappointing returns, but um, of 6.05% last year, that's up now to 6.59%. Um, and we think that it actually could be quite a good year for Ardmore. Max is asking, what commission do you charge to sell the cask at exit? Um, the, the absolute maximum is 15%. We sort of negotiate that on the day. Um, the idea being that uh, we arrive at a figure that the seller, the investor is happy with. Um, obviously, uh, we sort of need some uh, some payment for our hard work and uh, and obviously arriving at a figure that the buyer is happy with as well. So you say 15% uh, as an absolute maximum, uh, obviously 15% of sort of high value cash would be uh, a little over the top. So uh, it's negotiable on the day, but 15% um, is the absolute maximum. Um, Max is asking, what is the better investment, Irish or Scottish whiskey? Well, we love Irish whiskey here at Brayburn Whiskey. Um, but again, the industry, the Scottish whiskey industry is much more sort of uh, regulated. Um, we're seeing a bit of a, a renaissance now with Irish whiskey and our, our sort of our belief is that in the future, Irish whiskey would be a viable investment. But you know, sort of the history of the distilleries, data points, et cetera, et cetera, things that sort of allow us to come to conclusions on how a cask of whiskey might perform in the future. We simply don't have that data with, uh, with Irish whiskey. Um, um, and that's, that's, I think, everything. I hope that's been of some use. Um, yeah, I think I've answered everybody's questions there. Um, obviously, the, the report will go out to you. I think um, that should be going out to you if it's not already with you. Uh, our team will be getting copies of that across so you can sit uh, and sort of really have a look at the data. Um, and, and obviously, if you have any further questions, please feel free to get in touch with us and speak to myself or a member of our team. Again, I hope that's been helpful. All right. And I wish you all a good afternoon. Thanks again for attending. Bye bye now.